The flu is one thing, but concussions are another. The NFL is getting its fair share of criticism over the issue. It has made some changes, but what else can be done? The NFL Players Association is working with UNC to find out. Hit after hit after hit. Football's deadliest weapon. Super Bowl winning safety Dave Durson took his own life. Former NFL defensive back Vincent Fuller knows the risks players take. One thing that is guaranteed in football is that you will injure yourself. Now, the severity of that injury is it varies, but you will receive some nicks and some bruises or more. The or more is what prompted the NFL Players Association three months ago to develop the trust. Hey, what's up? I'm Spice Adams. I'm Hunter Hillenmeyer. And I'm Chester Pitts. A rehabilitation program for former players who struggle with life after football. When you go to the combine, you go through every physical test that you can imagine to, uh, to make sure that you're okay. And after you leave, there isn't an exit combine. So this is our exit combine. The NFLPA is partnering with the UNC Brain and Body Program to help guide retirees through physical and mental problems. Neuropsychologist Carla Thompson. A lot of these guys are really, really concerned about what the game they love might be doing to their brains. Fuller, who retired in 2011, is hopeful he'll see results. Just to get a baseline uh, in terms of, you know, brain issues uh, that I may be subject to older in life uh, so that I can come back five or ten years from now and see if there's any regression or if I've maintained the same cognitive level that I once had. Thompson says discovering problems sooner rather than later is the best way to approach each case. Early identification of areas of impairment um, is essential to devising treatment plans that may be helpful. Adjusting to normal life, though, is something Fuller says can be harder than conquering physical rehab. The structured system that you have in the league, the time to be here, the time to be there, the, the meetings, this, that, and the third, that leaves you, and it's tough to hold your own self accountable. Thompson recognizes this mental burden in retirees. It's not that unusual for retired or retiring players to have some difficulties with emotional adjustment. Transitioning from being you know, a larger-than-life football hero to being in some ways just a, a normal person can be difficult. UNC healthcare physicians guide former players like Fuller through life coaching, so, nutritional planning, and life. financial planning, all key elements of the trust that Fuller says are invaluable. You need to know that you're you know, physically okay, you need to know that you're mentally okay, and if you're not, you need to know what type of preventable ways or treatable ways there are to help you with those problems. And that's exactly what leaders of the partnership aim to achieve. Tulane University's Institute of Sports Medicine and the Cleveland Clinic are two other national locations, in addition to UNC, that are official partners with the Trust. It's a new semester, a new year, but some things just won't go away. We're talking about UNC's athletic scandal. I'm Mary Alice McMillan. And I'm Landon Dowdy. It all started with Marvin Alston's tweet, but now a new person is taking the stage. Her name is Mary Willingham. You've heard a lot about her lately, and Delia D'Ambra is standing by live with her story. Delia. That's right, Landon. I'm live in front of South Building. Over the last week, UNC administrators have been reevaluating Mary Willingham's research regarding academic integrity of student, student athletes in the major revenue sports. I sat down with her this week to discuss her journey since the story broke. First, let's take a look at Mary Willingham. Mary Willingham. Willingham here claims this whistleblower Mary Willingham's research. You've heard her name for weeks in the news. Academic advisor Mary Willingham is the face behind the latest controversy surrounding the education of athletes at UNC and she feels the negative effects. There was a lot of hate, negative, you know, death um, messages sent to me. Um, I was concerned. She says her biggest hardships have come from coworkers and the university. The faculty meeting was the worst part of it because even though I wasn't there, I was watching it on Twitter and it was, um, it was a personal attack on my character. University officials maintain Willingham's character is not the focus of their investigation or actions. Rather, it's the validity of her research. Willingham is holding her ground. The data is the data, and I'm going to stand by it, and I guess I'm going to break university policy or uh, federal law if I uh, talk about it. But the bottom line on it is, you know, if, if, if I break a law and I'm put in jail, guess what? I'll be able to teach a lot of people to read. Her data shows that of the 183 athletes she tutored from 2004 to 2012, 60% read between a 4th and 8th grade level, 
and 8 to 10 percent read below a third grade level. Willingham says it's the faces behind these numbers that motivate her. When I, when I start to feel like, what am I doing, and ask myself that question, I just can close my eyes and I can see the faces of the athletes that we let go here without a real degree or a real chance at a real education. She says there are other factors to consider in addition to her own research about the university's admission standards for revenue sport athletes. If our football and basketball players, men's, if they were white, would we be treating them the same way? Fair treatment for students is what Willingham says is her ultimate goal, and she is hopeful her actions will make it happen. I really do believe that change is coming. Change is coming, and so I invite any of those critics to get on board. Opening the door to invite her critics with open arms is exactly what she says she'll continue to do. University officials have declined to comment on this story, but say that their investigation is still ongoing. Landon, back to you. 44, that's how many North Carolinians have died from flu-related illness this season. No deaths on campus, but plenty of cases of the flu. Tissues, lots of water, and bowls of soup are three things sophomore Kelly Swanson has stocked in her dorm room. Catching the flu and a trip to the hospital weren't in her plans. I don't remember ever having the flu before. Um, I think the last time I got really sick was like seventh grade. <laughs> Getting sick has taken its toll. I couldn't walk. I could barely really move that much. Swanson falls in the younger age range of those hit hardest this season. Epidemiologist for the North Carolina Division of Public Health, Zach Moore, knows why younger and middle-aged people are affected more. The main flu strain that's circulating is a strain called influenza A H1N1, and that strain is not as severe in the elderly. Uh, people who were born before 1957, uh, many of them have some immunity to H1N1. More than half of the 59 reported deaths from flu last year were people 65 years or older. Moore says strains vary from season to season and everyone is susceptible. These things do happen and they don't just happen to the elderly or to people who are extremely sick. You know, there's um, flu can be serious for, for anybody. Moore says the key to preventing the spread of flu and keeping yourself healthy is in your very own hands and making sure you wash them as many times a day as possible. The campus community and dorm residents like Swanson are at a higher risk though. Flu activity goes up there before it goes up in the rest of the state. So college students definitely are always early with the flu activity.